sexuality or gender through these four figures, but instead how all four, but our three, depend on each other to support a specific normative force and form. That is, they're all seeking to be normative. Crucial to this discussion then is not simply Foucault, so much as his teacher of George Cognier, which I'm not going to talk about a little bit, but not much, insofar as his approach to normativity allows us to rethink the relevance of biopolitics, biopower, and normativity in the contemporary, I think, formation of power we're experiencing, which is something like Gianto power. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try and do it quickly. Cool? Yes. Okay. That's a pause. Now we're starting again. All right. Do we have water? That's not a geontological question. That's actually a just a <laughs> uh, my throat is parched question. Um, okay, so here we go. There's a coastal tidal creek in northern Australia where a young girl lies face down. She came to this creek as a young, very beautiful teenage girl, a chiefel in the language, the MEN language, which is the language of this area. She was a teenage girl who decided one day to dress as a young man. And so she equipped herself with male clothes and hunting implements, including a spear and a spear thrower. As she traveled down the coast, she did various things that we know about, some of us, including spearing a wallaby, which is that thing that hops with a tail on it. Um, but at the heart of her story concerns a sexual encounter she had with an old man. As she passed between two coastal points, a bird told her an old man was coming. Uh, and so she lay belly down in the sand. She dug two holes to hide her breasts because she's cheap out. So that's a part you want to hide. Uh, the old man, thinking he came up and thinking he was, she was a young man, insisted that she get up and cook the wall because an old man gets the boss around everybody. She put him off claiming to be sick, you know, Marichilk, and you know Marichilk, and he eventually tired of waiting and left with the wallaby. She basically told him to take the wallaby and he could keep going. As he walked away, another bird told him that the young man was actually a teenage woman. He rushed back and a fight ensued. He won. She remains there, but she doesn't, re she doesn't remain there by the side of the creek. Indeed, she is the creek. And if you knew how or where to look, you would see her watery outline, her honey implements turned to reefs, and other parts of her encounter with the old man scattered nearby. That is, Chipel's encounter with the old man made and is the local topography. She now divides two coastal points, marks the boundaries between two language groups and social groups, and joins this region to other regions up and down the coast. This is what Ruby Yilney Garrowin taught a bunch of us. Now, you'd be wrong to believe, however, that in the beginning, the earth was a formless void and with darkness covering the surface of the deep, and into this void came Chipo. Chipo came to where she now rests from the east, where she also remains, though in a different form. And many of the people, things, and animals she encountered as she was walking down the coast, um, many of the people well, walking down the coast continued themselves down the coast or cut inland, and south, some dug, dug water holes, some raised mountains, some hollowed out caves, some ridden swamps along the way. Moreover, by the time that Chipo arrived where she now lays down, other things might have already passed by there. It doesn't or didn't matter who came first or second or third when I and a bunch of my cohort, indigenous, the, then being indigenous cohort, started learning about the adventures of Chipo and others from Ruby, from Betty Billowalk, from Agnes Lippo, and others in the mid-80s. The problems that these women and other men asked Chipo to solve was not how an initial emptiness came to have dimension, how something emerged from nothing, how the one broke the grip of the zero, how the beginnings began, nor was the problem which entity came first, second, or third, that is, ordinal numbers, did not in any way subsume the coexistence of multiple entities. Chipo's birth and Chipo's death was also not a compelling question. That is, you could ask where, where was she born or where did she die, and, but it never elicited much of a discussion. The questions people asked when they asked about Chipo and talked about Chipo concerned her directionality, the course along which she was moving, so they're very clear, we had to learn that. Her orientation, that is the determination of her relative position to other pl places, 
and her connections, that is her extension into other segments of local, regional, and trans-regional geontological formations. And this older generation demanded and asked, but demanded, how and why she responded to different people and different human actions in this way or that. Though if someone was there and, the, and she built in one thing, why was that? That's what they were interested in. If I or my colleagues wanted to know more about Chico, they and I would have to know her intimately. That is, we'd have to be there and follow her topological coordinates, or we would have to track her adventures to someplace else. And there we would find, if we went there, other people, other stories, other places. And we would find not only that there were multiple other Chipels, that is, multiple other forms and versions of Chipel, we would also discover that within each of these versions were multiple modes, qualities, and relations. Demand, depending on which Chipel you encountered, you would find different ways and capacities to divide, connect, and extend geographies and biographies. So it was this, in the beginning, was multiple Chipel. While neither Chipel's birth nor her death was a pressing problematic, Ruby Yingley's and Bill Walk and et cetera's family obligation to her continuing existence was, and vitally so. This shouldn't be a surprise. While Chipel never seemed exactly something that was born, and perhaps as we'll see, something that exactly dies, she could radically alter her arrangement of existence in ways that would be disastrous for her human kin. And her human kin could alter their arrangement of existence in ways that would be disastrous for Chipel. In other words, and according to the folks that insisted we know this, Chipel and her human kin were internal to each other's arrangement. Chipel established an estrin normativity that created the human task of caring about and for her. That is, minding her legs by hunting in the mangroves. And if you saw her, she has legs. So you hunt in the mangroves. Um, minding her legs by hunting in the mangroves, walking around along her spear thrower, which is a reef with oysters on it, fishing in her creek, and etc. If Yoni's family exceeded, that is, if they gave way, if they remained con committed to her watery norms, her force of normativity, Chipo would in turn turn to Yoni's family and care for it. If this rapport was broken, Chipo wouldn't die, but she would turn away from her human kin. After all, she had changed her arrangement of existence before, twice in fact. First, Chipo was an adolescent girl who dressed up like a young man. Then she became a creek. These morphological mutations did not kill her at any point. She did not die. Instead, instead these mutations allowed her to persist in being, though persist in being in another form or arrangement. She would give Yoni, if Yoni's family turned away, then Chico would give her family her watery backbone, that is, turn away, drying her riverbeds, and withdrawing her resources. Thus, I think it would be wrong to think that the meaning of Chipo is captured in the narratives that exist about her. The deepest truth for Chipo is the normative force that she was able to exert on her surroundings. Hence, I'm referring here, of course, to uh, Kang Yem's mid-20th century understanding of normativity as that which establishes norms, that which has the power to establish a norm. For Kang Yim, there exists a, quote, spontaneous effort, and here I want to just emphasize this, peculiar to life, to struggle against that which obstructs its preservation and development taken as a norm. Right. And here, you know, he's, he's moving from Conatos and, and Spinoza. As Robert Esposito has noted, effort, that, that is this effort, spontaneous for Kang Yim, spontaneous effort, peculiar to life, for Esposito, Effort is key here. Effort defines the living as those kinds of entities that creatively exceed the objective parameters of life. These objective conditions are the deadly inertia and indifference against which life is defined for Esposito and I think for coming in as the activity of opposition. Life tries to win against death, and all this is his 
his quotes, life tries to win against death in all senses of the word to win. For most in the sense of winning, winning in gambling, life gambles against a growing entropy, unquote. The reason Kangyan placed so much emphasis on these creative efforts of life, life, Kanatus, was to lift life out of the purely positivist models of his time. So the natural sciences, if we're thinking about the interesting. But Kangyan's conceptual framework would have to find a creative way to survive itself, that is, it would have to survive, as it concerns out of which it emerged change. So the, the theoretical models change. The new conceptual environment of human governance is the place in which his Kangyan's notion of life as this normative force were, of course, his student Michel Foucault's theories of biopower. And here we can see, not maybe Foucault, but in Esposito, the question was, and for both of them, how can a politics of life become a politics of death? And can we see biopower as both having a negative form and a positive form? That is, for Esposito, a positive biopower would maintain the positivity of life as that unrestrainable power to exist beyond negative biopower. So again, it's life and life's effort and, the, and understanding that effort as trying to keep in place a norm or a normative force. Now, we should not quickly pass over this idea that having an indwelling effort against entropy, that in having an indwelling effort against entropy, some entities are able to be more than their so-called objective conditions. Right? That's how, what, how we separate love from non -life. It forces us then to ask, especially in the context of the Anthropocene, or whatever this thing is that we're in, it forces us to ask whether we can simply extend Kangyan's philosophy of biological, biontological, or philosophy of biology to all entities. Or whether some entities have to be separated out. That is, can Chipo be folded into a philosophy of biology? There's nothing simple about this extension. That is, is Chipo alive? Can Chipo establish norms in the way in which I've been describing it? There's nothing simple about such an extension. If effort is a key means through which life is distinguished from all other entities, then we should be careful if we think, well, OK, so Chipo is part of, of biopolitics in the sense of a form of life that, that is attempting to maintain its normative power. We should be careful when applying Kangyan's biological normativity to Chipo's estronormativity. In what sense is she the inert and indifferent framework within which life forms then move? In what sense is she even there? If we're going to talk about these arrangements in a, in a new geontological sense rather than just a biopolitical sense, in what sense do we even say that Chipel is there? Where, after all, does she begin and end? Does she begin and end where the sands accumulate as her breasts dug into the sand shift? Or does she begin and end further down shore where the sands drift out? Does she begin and end where the oysters and fish and mangrove roots and seeds and humans come and go? Does she begin where the wind reaches the top of her wateriness? She seems more self-evidently a mixture rather than a substance, an arrangement rather than a being. She is not, in other words, a self-evidently sovereign subject in the way in which we have come to understand sovereign subjects. She is a composite, it would seem, non-sovereign, non-life being. Part biological, part geological, part meteorological. This composite, flexible, material spacing is, and here's where it seems to break with our understanding of a sovereign subject, this composite, flexible, material spacing is relying on a host of entangled entities, including the entanglement in mangrove roots and reef formations, and on her, she tells human parasites. 
Indeed, according to Yogi, what makes Chipo here in this, that is the woman who sat down, who laid down here, is the fact that all of the entities that compose her remain oriented towards each other in such a way that produce her as a thisness, as an experiential destination and departure. Sand comes and goes from her sandbars, fish travel up and down her creek, oysters struggle to stay attached to the reef. All of these entities oriented toward each other become something none of them are separate from each other. They become cheapo. Chipo is an intersection, though, only so long as she is an intersection of entities oriented to each other. This is why our obligation to her is urgent, pressing, and ethical. If we turn away, she does not exist in the same way. She turns away as an arrangement. But how can we say at once and the same time that Chipo is a non-sovereign, non-like entity and that she establishes an assemblage as a norm, that she has normative power? How can we say that she's there in this, but without being able to define clearly her extension or her limitation? Paradoxes indeed wash up on our sandbanks when we try to apprehend her through a philosophy of life, through a biopolitical imaginary. On the one hand, she's, a non, she's non-sovereign insofar as her capacity to endure time over time is extended into and through other entities and the sub-arrangements that keep them in turn in place. On the other hand, once in place, she does exert something like, something that feels like a sovereign-like force of persistence on all these sub-arrangements, that once they're locked in place, then they seem to, that the arrangement itself seems to have a kind of persistent enduring. Her river, river mutation established then in this locking together a norm for how other entities within her reach should, can, and will behave, thrive, and evolve. Her form, for instance, allows fish to run through her and change the salinity of the water as she heaved it in and out of these coastal tides. So she does establish that. But she was neither born nor does she die. That is, she's not life in the way in which we understand life to be defined by birth, persistence, and death. It's finicky. She neither emerged from a void, which is, again, in a philosophical sense, birth as thought through event, nor uh, where is it? Uh, uh, she neither emerged from a void, nor will she return to. That is the problem of death and finitude. Thus, I'd be surprised that Kang Yam would have considered Chi a form of life, or that she exhibited the same or analogous unrestrained power to exist that he would think that human teenagers have. Chipo asks us then to consider how the rescue of life from its objective parameters, that what Kang Yim was doing, what Esposito is doing, others are doing, produces her as a realm of inertness more terrifying than death itself. That is, the geontological formation as the undead. Thus what Chipo means is what she is now and may be becoming in a set of historically situated dependencies and obligations that will or won't support her as an arrangement of existence. And one of these supports has to do with the problematic of biopower in life itself. That is how we define life and how we define it in a certain way. It separates out other arrangements as non-life, as inert as not having this amazing power that defines us, this effort to persist. What then are the forces that are challenging the intersection of attention that maintains Chipo's current form and forestalling or speeding up her radical turning away from her human family? Although we cannot say what Chipo is, this girl that became a boy, that became a creek, we can say her strategies for orienting others toward her worked for a good while. Story told that the, what we learned about Chico from a generation born around the turn of the 20th century, about how to navigate her body and her legs, still worked when the, that generation's kids and grandkids and I started moving around the area. But Chico will need new strategies if she's to stay in place into the next century. 
The social, ecological, and economic materials that compose her and from which she draws and extrudes nourishment have significantly changed since Yingli was a young teenager. And even in Ruby Yoni's life, we, we have to understand that her understanding of Chipa was not some tradition, right, but rather was an analytics of how to keep Chipa alive and what Ruby Yoni was experiencing during vicious settler colonialism at, and, and by the end of her life, late liberal forms of recognition. That is, every generation who is charged with this arrangement is engaged in the analytics of how or whether to be on the side of that normative force that is Chita. OK. So part of the problem Chita faces and what various people make of her or attempting to turn her into, what she thinks she is at core, and how much power they have to make her conform to what they think she is at core. For instance, and I turn to Linda Yerwin, the second figure. If Linda Yerwin, Ruby Yoni's daughter, had described Chipel to the Prime Minister of Julia Gillard in June or November of 2011, Linda Yerwin, who is indigenous Emmy, she's 10 years younger than I am, so to tell you how old I am, she's 42. Um, she might have described Chipo as a dreaming or a totem for her family. She would have expected by saying this that the Prime Minister of Australia would know that dreaming and totem are translatable concepts loosely meaning that this creek is a spiritual site in Linda's traditional country. If Gillard asked Linda Yerwin, are you from the Chipo clan? Linda might have said, no, I'm from the Long Yam clan, but Chipo is also my dream meaning that she goes within her traditional country, but not her patrilineal or matrilineal totem. And all these words would have been used. Linda might have ventured even further that she learned about Chipo from her deceased mom, Ruby Yoni, who was born in the region around the 1920s, as well as from Yoni's uh, sister and cousin, Agnes Lippo and Betty Gilroy. Linda would say these things because she was her, because of her birth in 1972 placed her in a specific moment in the national and international reconfiguration of the liberal governance of difference. In Australia in the 70s through really through about 2007, this new form of governance went by different names depending on whether it was addressed to non-white settler communities such as Greeks, East or South Asians, Italians or Central Africans, or to indigenous people. In the former, Australians use the word multiculturalism and for the, 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 the formation of the governance of difference. In the latter, it's often the phrases used self-determination, that is, indigenous self-determination, um, but say, Greek multiculturalism, etc. But in both cases, governments attempted to tame the radical nature of anti-colonial and new social movements, which were tearing the face off of paternalistic colonialism, gender racialization, and heterosexuality. To tame the demands for indigenous sovereignty, Australia passed the first piece of significant Aboriginal land rights legislation in 76, the Aboriginal Land Rights Act of 1976. In 1989, at the age of 17, Linda participated in her first land rights hearing. And throughout her adulthood, she was told by the state and its advocates, but also on television in the public sphere, that her rights to her land pivoted on her retention of her cultural traditions that narratives like Chipo, and it was a narrative, I abstracted out of the story, like Chipo exemplified. If Linda was to secure title over her traditional country, she would be, have to be able to tell government officials like Julia Gillard that places like Chipo were dreamings and a dreaming totem for her family. Moreover, she was told the nation wanted her to maintain her beliefs and obligations to the spiritual life of the landscape because her belief in places like Chico and her obligation to them made the nation truer to itself. But what the dreaming meant changed from the time that Linda was born and the moment that I am imagining her talking to Julia Gillard. This didn't happen, but we, we actually, she and I were talking about this one. In June and November 2011, Gillard, the Prime Minister, was touring the Northern Territory in the lead up to a very difficult and ultimately failed re-election bid. 
And if you guys haven't seen it, there's like this famous Dillard YouTube video in which in Parliament she goes on, a, I think it's a 15-minute um, uh, attack on the current Prime Minister for his sexism. It's an amazing video. Um, uh, so she's touring there, there this time. In June, Gillard visited Alice Springs, which is in the, you know, the desert in central Australia, to discuss the Northern Territory National Emergency Response um, to Indigenous Welfare. This is, the response is usually just titled The Intervention, and the, in, the Intervention was a set of legislative changes to federal laws pertaining to Indigenous land tenure, welfare provision, and legal prosecution. These changes were put in place after a national sex panic about alleged child sex abuse in rural Aboriginal communities and town camps. The state intervention, the state intention of the intervention was to normalize, and it's very clear, to normalize indigenous affairs by normalizing supposedly dysfunctional family and sexual practices relative to non-indigenous public norms. Now, whether these, whether there was no comparative norms, like how much sexual child abuse was in other communities, was never on the table. It was just a classic, beautiful, chilling sex panic. <laughs> yeah, I'd never been, I'm not a total homosexual, but I had never experienced a sex panic before, so I was really like, quite intrigued and horrified. Now, under the shadow of this rhetoric, the federal government withdrew significant infrastructural funding for rural and remote indigenous communities, pushed for market solutions to indigenous well-being, increased police presence on remote communities and town camps, and seized control of community infrastructures. The sexual normative force of the intervention did not manifest merely at the macro sociological level, that is law and thing. The constant media coverage of indigenous sexuality, addiction, and violence created new micro sociological environments inside and outside of indigenous communities. Thus, if Linda were to tell Gillard the story of Chico, she would leave out some details, shorten, subtract, and carefully decontextualize some of that story I told you, and indeed, as I have done here today. Let's Chico become not a creek, but an example of sexual perversion secreted in the heart of her indigenous topology. Top, topography, sorry. And it would not simply be Linda and her family who were smeared by the sexual scandal, scandal, but Linda would also have to think about her mother smeared in the same way. Of course, Chico even if we stay within the sexual, sexual framework, could also become many other things in 2011. And with it, Linda and Yomi. Chipo could become transgender. Ah, oh, this is a story of transgender. That just like you, Beth, look, I'm not transgender, but just like you, a girl that dressed up a boy and went down the sand. I was like, okay. Um, she could become transgender, she could become butch, because these transfigurations, these making her into something else, are also possible within the contemporary fields in which her legs now extend. That is, she lives in this world, not some other world. And so her legs extend into a, well, what is Chico? A girl who dresses as a boy. These contemporary public sexual norms and discourses are then part of the objective parameters of Chico's existence. They are both the for with and against which Linda considers what she will say or not, what we discuss, I can say or not, and they are the conditions against which Chico herself must creatively adjust. These conditions are both inside Linda and Chico right now equally. But both Linda and Chico will also have to adjust to the normalizing force, not only to public norms of sexuality, anti-normativity or normativity, but she will have to adjust to the normalizing force of neoliberal markets, and critically importantly, in the Australian context, she will have to adjust to extractive capital. Both of Gillard's trips to the north of Australia took place during one of the biggest mining booms in Australian history. From 2004 to 12, the mining sector contributed on average 7.5% of the national GDP, and this buffered the Australian economy from, from the 2008 financial crisis, and set the dollar, Australian dollar, to heights never be seen before in a decade. In the Northern Territory, in particular, the mining boom was centered on indigenous lands. 
The Northern Land Council, for instance, reports that 80% of the value of minerals extracted in the territory came from indigenous lands. And Giller was up in the Northern Territory trying to, she was trying to persist in an arrangement of being by emphasizing that her party, the Labour Party, both depended on and was forced to navigate this major economic industry. How would she respond to the fact that it seemed that Australia was able to weather one of the major economic collapses in late liberalism by allowing the mining sector free access to um, indigenous lands, which was part of the intervention? in the context of what Gillard was also trying to do, which was to tax the mining industry so that some of the profit from common resources would be redistributed. And indeed, when Gillard tried to introduce a mining tax in, in, order, uh, in an attempt to capture some of the private property generated from public, access, public assets for public expenses, the mining council, led by Gina Reinhart, the famously wealthy miner, attacked the Prime Minister in public, and I think we now understand was in working in um, uh, allegiance with the sexist public attacks on Hillary that then led to, in part, to her non-election. As a state, withdrew public support from indigenous programs and communities. And Gillard, as part of that, talks to Linda Yerwin, talking about Chico. Linda Yerwin and her fa extended family were told that if they wanted to rise above the poverty level, they needed then to open their country to capital, and specifically mining exploration in and around places like Chico. Members of her extended family had other proposals about how to generate income from their lands while maintaining a, the kind of mutual intention they thought would keep Chico in place. One such project was a green GPS-based augmented reality project for tourists. So you use uh, uh, augmented reality so you don't actually develop the land, you just sort of super green with your, your, with your cell phone. <laughs> but as they tried to finance its development, the high Australian dollar made tourist ventures risky investment endeavors. The, this irony was not lost on Midge's family that the mining industry's success meant the alternative projects to mining were priced out of reach. Green dollars cost more than mining dollars, especially if mining dollars seem to just come out of nowhere and demand the la labor. And it's also the case, and I, I, I trace this, this is the book, and I trace it in other chapters, the green of augmented reality is not green when you actually track it out, so I'm happy to talk about that. What I want to do by just laying out these legal forces, these market forces, is simply to say that all these forces are moving through the practical reason about what Chipo is and what Chipo will become. And all these forces are within the current arrangement of existence that, that seem to be symptomatic about what kind of formation of power we're in. Thus, when reminding uh, of the, her family of the worth of trying to stay oriented toward the creek, staying part of this arrangement, Linda has to indeed navigate a certain forms of impossibility. Either, and in some ways it's often presented as this, and I'll, it's presented as a very often simple question, in the objective parameters of existence of people like Linda are asked a question whether the continuing existence of one kind of woman, that is Chico, the woman who was a girl who dressed up with boring and lay down on the creek, is practically equivalent to the actual young women, such as Linda herself, her relatives, and her grandchild. Is Chipel's existence worth the poverty of her family? Is she worth, for instance, an iPhone? Thus, part of the problem Chipel faces is that if she's going to persist as a normative force, is that she's not the same thing across these arrangements of existence that these three women represent. 
they know they can only stay, these three women themselves know that they, they can only stay in place if they're current, in the current form, if they can make Chico and each other into a specific kind of existence. That is, each one of these women has to make the other one into something. For instance, Linda has to make Chipo, in, who is a geontological arrangement, into something, a geontological arrangement with, that doesn't have the parameters of life as defined by birth, conjunctus, and death. Something that has equal worth to these things we call life. Giller has to make Linda into someone who understands Tipel as a narrative and an opportunity if Giller is going to stay in existence if she didn't. And Tipel has to make both of those women understand that if they are going to arrange, maintain their arrangement, that is, as an indigenous person in this world and as a state form, then they have to give way to her estrogen normativity. Of course, and this is where I'll end, part of the problem is, is that when I say that Chipa intends or seeks or will have to make these other two women accede to her estrogen normativity, we reach the limit, indeed, of how we think about the relationship between forms of agency and forms of life. Does Chipo, in fact, seek anything? Can she speak, let alone intend? And by intention, I mean that, supposedly, for most, Chipo cannot give an account of the reasons for her actions and the future toward which these actions need to be in effect. That is, for the most part, philosophies of intention, but also critical theories of power. power. Here we go back to Kong Yam and this effort. Have seen intention as a mental state, as part of what having a mind or having life of a particular sort allows some entities to do, but not others. Non-human animals might have purposeful action, say the purpose of specific actions of the fish that run through people's legs, are to eat and not be eaten. We might extend this to plants, saying that mangroves that hold her muddy, muddy skin in place act in order to receive nutrients from air and soil. But do geological formations engage in purposeful actions? For many, to have an intention is to be able to give an account or have an account of something, <laughs> to move from noise to logos. Can she do this? If we're going to puncture, that is, or come to understand that in this current arrangement in the 21st century in which we are, the figures of sexuality and the formation of bio power that we've been, the formations of power that we've grown accustomed to, have to make a space for something like Chipo that is actually not like us, although we might be, indeed, like her. That is, we, if we read ourselves from her original multiplicity, might ourselves be simply an arrangement of existence, dependent on a whole host of entities and sub-entities that will either keep us in place or not. And thus, the range that the, the biotological arrangement is in fact simply a subset of a much broader geontological arrangement. Thank you. Yeah. 
Mm. I just wonder if you can comment at all about the temporal. Um, I mean, it seems to me that there'd be a temporal aspect to it as well. But it's the way we, the way we're able to perceive um, Chitel in terms of the arrangement of her limbs or her backbone um, and the way the shape changes. The change implies um, a perception of time, which I think would be different and out of sync with uh, the way in which a human being can perceive space as we move through it, but the, the overarching um, sort of story of this involves change over vast amounts of time as change in geological formation does. So I just wonder if there's a temporal, there's a time aspect to um, kind of out of sync Yes, but I'm going to now heavily qualify that quick yes. Um, and attempted, uh, I'm speaking here, me, I'm speaking. Um, so one of the reasons why in other papers, and I, I should, I'll say very quickly just a frame, this is a, a, the second chapter of a longer book um, in which I'm trying to uh, unpack what formation of power, what formation of power we're in. Are we, are, what is its, what are its dimensions, what are its tropes? So I should say the, the, the three figures, it's not actually the four figures of the Anthropocene, the three figures of the Anthropocene that I think would substitute for the four figures of biopower, not the Anthropocene, geontological power, are animism, desert, and um, terrorists, green and Islamic. And there's, in the animist, um, there's the ride, the reemergence of ontology across the disciplines as a as a new theoretical formation. In terms of the desert, um, uh, the emergence of radical ecology and the reemergence of say uh, radical feminist ecology, etc. And security studies for green and um, Islamic terror. Um, the reason I say that is that. Uh, Part of what we have to do is, and this will come to time, part of, I think what we have to do is say that these are symptomatic figures. A, we have to remember that these four figures weren't exits to biopower. They were symptomatic extrusions of biopower. Um, and so animism, desert, terrorism are not exits to geontological power. They are symptoms of it. And that becomes quite important because, say, in, in relation to animism or totemism, so my friends, you know, they're totemic, right? And they know, they've been taught they're totemic, and they know that in order to open the spigots of, of uh, state resources and capital, they have to be totemic, but in a certain way that's not now sexually, perversely totemic, right? Um, and, the, and being animist or totemic, especially totemic, um, uh, entails a certain kind of temporal framework right? that, that has to be experienceable by those who are in charge of this state. Um, so that uh, the, story, the story of Chibel is considered a story that is passed down over time and can be diluted more or less. Right. And that, would, that, that keeping the story in place marks the, abil the, the ability of someone telling the story to be more or less authentic. Okay. So there's an entire temporal apparatus embedded in all of this. Um, that, and there's temporal apparatus embedded in the anthropocene, the geological time. Geological time, great distance of time. And our, our colleague Depeche, it's like, how does that uh, how does that, uh, how does geological time interrupt the task of the historian? Well, how does geological time interrupt the task of the, all these disciplines, right? These humanist disciplines. All right. So part of what my work has done, say in the last book, and part of what I'm trying to do here is say, I don't want to talk about time at all, almost. But I do want to, instead of that, in order to say, this is not a temporal narrative. This is an arrangement narrative. What is how in the given arrangement of existence that is 
Chipo, let me do this. Chipo <coughs> isn't out of time. Chipo's lakes are always in time that they're in. Those waters are in whatever it is now, right? So in the 70s, her waters were in multiculturalism and uh, 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 politics of recognition. And now they're in, um, you know, extractive capital and the enterprise subject and et cetera. So how now do we keep this thing in place? Do we want to keep this thing in place? What are the resources for keeping it? What is it? Chipo is not what Chipo was in the 1970s. No one thinks she is. She's a little transgender now. She wasn't transgender in the 1970s. She was transgender whenever in the 1920s. She is transgender now. Now, that's now, 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 now. But I, 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 and the reason I do that is to try and interrupt what is in this case, not in all cases, but here, um, the function of time and tense in the governance of existence. Um, and that's why you're right. It's a very, in some ways, spatial and not temporal in the usual sense, sort. Um, and the second reason is, is that, of course, these, from a geontological point of view, we are talking about arrangements of space. And I think it's, that's what I want to try to think of. Yeah. Good. So it's easy. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was great. I'm really rich. I'm wondering how you're, you think of this notion of geontological arrangements in relation to uh, Jane Bennett's idea of uh, yeah. uh, this is bright, private matter. They yeah, that's right. Clearly to have affinities, but maybe you want to make some distinctions. Or? Yeah. Um, the part of what you, what I, I don't have a lot of time. So what I left out a lot of, and what I've written about other, uh, fleshed out more, and then I'll get to the, the, the vibrant matter and the animacy, the new animacy. Is that is is indeed what I mentioned, which is this the distinction between life and non-life that subtends contemporary critical theory, right, and the natural sciences, both of them. Um, and with and in a nutshell, with that distinction resting on a certain um, transposition of the definition of life as that which is born. That which can be born, persist, reproduce, and die. So you know, even in the, the even in our geo, bio, chemical new discipline, that definition of life persists. And then the questions we ask are, what allowed life to come to spring it from a certain geological conditions? What allowed, allowed biological life to emerge out of certain geochemical conditions? Um, could there be life? in other galaxies, blah, blah, blah. There's a transposition then, uh, I think, that we see in critical theoretical domains, which I mentioned, but with birth being event. So the problem event, from a critical philosophical sense, is the problem of birth. That is, what? how does something come from nothing? The zero and the one. The problem of conitus, the persistence, the kanyan, the effort, right? And then finitude, which has really defined, in some ways, uh, critical, theoretical, and philosophical terms since, well, certainly since Heidegger. That is, Heidegger's Leiden is actually, although we say, you know, it turned from life to um, Dasein, it actually, Dasein is defined as if it was life, right? Birth, and then the, how do, what stance do we take toward finitude? Um, what I'm trying to do in this book, and with Chipel, I use different geological formations as uh, kind of tropes, material, reals, um, is to not say, uh, well, let's turn to non-life and see what it can tell us, but rather to ask, what is maintaining this distinction between life and non-life? That which keeps us in place is as much of a arrangement composed of all kinds of things 
as what keeps Chico in place. I don't, do I die or do I change forms? No, I rot, but in what sense is that finitude? You know, what's the drama of our finite state? I just get rid of this drama about finitude and death. It's like, oh, there's no death, you just rot and change forms. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, now, we can, we can mourn the change of form. Though you can have all your mourning and melancholia. You really can. Um, but the, the precarity, vulnerability, all is just like, wow, what if? That <laughs> drama is part and parcel of what maintains the distinction and thus what maintains certain apparatuses of capital and liberalism. So, animism and vibrancy. I love Jay Bennett's work. I mean, I like all of these are very smart, fantastic people. But, there's always but. But, um, I think what's happening in animism, that's why when I say it's one of the three figures of whatever this is, Jim to Walter Power, we have to remember that it's a figure, it's not the exit. The trouble with animacy and vibrancy is that it extends life into everything rather than questioning. And, and that simply continuing of the, 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 the governance through that division. So when I say we're not in biopower anymore, and here's Chief as an example, there's uh, two rocks that, that there's, uh, there's this mayonnaise site that I talked about too in relation to mining. Um, I mean that biopower um, it's not merely the governance of life, but it's the governance, it's a maintain, maintenance of the division between life and life. And I don't think animism is going to get us out of there. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, okay. Okay. No, there's, there's, you know, they disagree with each other. Yeah, I don't mean to conflate the three. Right. I mean to try and try here. Okay, so there are two things, and it's a great question. I was waiting for the but, and I think that was the but. But I like what you're doing. I agree with that. I mean, but <laughs> um, I love the but part. The um, <laughs> well, it is an Anthropocene feminism. <laughs> um, no, in the, in the long, this is just like a grab. It's a kind of a, a, a flyover of the chapter. And, and in the actual chapter, I say, of course, it's not as if biopower has gone the way of things. And we can, that it hasn't gone the way of things you can see in the intervention, for instance. Um, the governments through sexuality of the population and discipline of the self are really in place and working. Um, nor for me is it, and it's, nor is it like biopower or geontological power, because I would say there's bios and the geos, and I'm saying that what Chipel, what the fall, what the rocks are doing is saying that division is under enormous, it just doesn't work anymore. Right. So, so part of what we're living through is the, the, the collapse of this division, even as it's being attempted to be held in place. Right. And I, I, this is an example, and there are many examples that look slightly different than the one I'm talking about. But I think across the board, it just 
you can't do anymore. And biogeochemistry is an example if you want. It's got to be something, something like something. Okay, so on the one hand, you're right. Biopower continues, and it continues both insofar as it is governments through life, but it also continues as the governance of that division. Are there resources in in Foucault? And is Kangyam different than Foucault? Is different than Esposito? Yeah, that's 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 absolutely right. In, in the longer versions, kind of slowly unpacked. Um, I would say there's, yeah, I mean, we can look at the, the, his, some of his dominant and perduring metaphors and see that as a resource. But for me, the real resource in Foucault has always been his deeper anti-philosophy than some of the other folks of his time. And by that, I mean something very simple, which is he wasn't the bad dude says, I hate bad dude. He says this, and I agree with this. Um, that there isn't, Foucault is not inventing a philosophy. He's not trying to create a term that will be used as a way of unpacking uh, anything and everywhere. Right? He's very much working, here's the metaphor, very much working in the what is this arrangement in which we find ourselves Right? How does one ask the question of what is this? Right? When you're in it. And how does one try and break? You're, you're, you're in it. You're part of the actual arrangement. But, do you, but you, you are also a potential otherwise in it. Okay. So I find that, that really useful. And then I think this is simply totally inspired by a kind of Foucault biopolitics or biopolitics saying, what the hell is this? And you need to stop just saying, oh, well, it was then, so it still is now. It's, you know, we were in bio, 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 we and with sexuality. It's like, it's the 21st century. <laughs> Maybe, but what if we started listening to the symptoms or hearing them or seeing them, this, both these weird clusters of theory and figure and the animus, the indigenous, the mestizo, um, ontology, one, you know, it's, it start just clustering to use that to break open how we usually go about doing things. I'll say why I want to arrange it. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but I, I, I'm just wondering why one wants to think about um, the fact that this is a particular moment mm. in a series of resignification. Mm. Uh, and I'm not really talking about Foucault here at all, because I'm, I'm asking it from, from a non Foucault view. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, there, yeah, the, you know, great question. The, um, let me say why I don't say resignification and why I actually don't say story, although I tell a story, but I try and push against it. Um, and that has to do with the, uh, and again, in the places in which 
So, so, so I usually talk about, like, from here, the formation of power looks like very much in that kind of movement. Um, and then say, I have no idea how far this might work. It's up to you guys to know that. Um, but the story, the story about, and the ability to repeat story about, um, is indeed here in many other places in North America, especially colonial settler context, um, absorbed into the politics of governance, the governance of theater. And what's extruded out of it is the, the, the material arrangement that in many ways is more important than the story. So it inverts the relationship. It's keeping this in place that matters. That's why in the talk I say, you know, that wasn't the story. Yeah, the story is it's a story and we understand the story. But the force, the ethical force on people was keeping it in place. And thus arrangement rather recent than the signification. Although I agree with you that again, what she feels is now, what she feels is then is can continually re-signified, and in being re-signified, that arrangement has to develop new tactics for maintaining itself over time. So the arrangement could take on, well, yeah, well, I'm transgender, so let's keep it in arrangement because it shows that. But the force was keeping it in, in, um, intact and persisting. Um, now, what was the second question? <laughs> Oh, the uniqueness of this moment. Oh, the uniqueness of this moment. Um, there's there are two ways I would answer that. On the one hand, I'd say you're totally right. There is no uniqueness of this moment. And part of what I try to do is say, at that point, the this this these were the forces that Chipel and others had to tackle in order to keep in place, and now these are the forces that Chico and other ones have to keep in place, and now these are the forces that Chico and others have to keep in place. So on one hand, I agree with you, and I say there's nothing unique from that perspective. On the other hand, there is something unique from the perspective of within our critical theoretical and philosophical conditions in the West, which has moved all over the world and into post-colonial theory and otherwise. Um, I think the, the inability for certain kinds of divisions to maintain themselves anymore. And that might be the effect of a lot of us making the arrangements that have kept things in place not working anymore. And that division is at core the division between life and non-life. That's what I think is particular about this moment. Oh, sorry. I, I, yeah, I'm just up here. I'm like, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. Just... <laughs> Someone's got me. Yeah, that's fine. I like that. Yes. Remember, Kang Yam, God bless him, he was trying to intervene in some particular debate. Okay, so that's that's great. And I agree with you. Matter of fact, I have, as we said, one could go back and try and mine Spinoza's ethics for a, not, a, a way of thinking about this effort of endurance or perseverance that was pre that distinction. So I think that's I think that's right. And then I had some thought that I just flew out of my head. Head like a bird. Um, uh, what it was getting at us, what it was getting at us. Oh, ow, I can't remember. It was something. Yeah. Oh, I know what it is. I know what it is. And this will be the last thing I have to say. Is that, but at the same time, and this is again, it's part of what unfolds as this long story unfolds in this book, 
is that the problem with going back to Conatos anywhere, um, just anywhere, is that it emphasizes, and this is what different about Esposito, which I don't, I'm very critical of, it emphasizes uh, this potentiation without extinguishment, not finitude, but maybe state transformation. And by that I don't mean states, I mean assembly. Um, I.e., everything has, once it, something is, if something is, it has an equal right to persist in being. Um, does it mean that two, I hear it come physics, two equal and opposing forces who cannot maintain themselves? So, so there's a way in which Conatus in the present, and I, you know, and I love Deleuze, but I think the kind of, not Deleuze himself, but a kind of post Deleuze, it's like potentiate everything, but we haven't really, really thought through that to potentiate is to extinguish, right? That we, and that's where the, both the normative from a kind of Habermasian or Nancy Fraser and the anti-normative and kind of knee-jerk queer, both of them are just wrong and they're happening together. If I want to keep cheap bill in place, they want to keep in cheap bill in place, something will be extinguished. And it might be the case. If we want to keep, you know, a certain arrangement of the, you know, wherever we are and however we thematize the space in place, something has to get. It just does. That will extinguish an arrangement. That's that was the other part. So yes and no. So let's extinguish me. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. 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 Oh